You have an MRI of the brain, say for headache, seizure, or another neurological symptom, and you find something unexpected. In this video, I'll review some of the common incidental findings on brain MRI. Now, many of these are well known to be benign, and I could confidently reassure my own patients, but please talk to your own medical provider for personal advice and interpretation of your own scans. And these are timestamps if you want to skip ahead. We'll start with arachnoid cysts. These are are fluid-filled spaces underneath the arachnoid matter, part of the meninges or coverings of the brain. On the left, you're looking at an axial image through the head like this. Here's the nose, and these are the ears. This is the medulla, and this is the cerebellum. And you can see this T2 bright fluid-filled structure, which is a retrocerebellar or behind the cerebellum arachnoid cyst, a very common location. On the right, you're looking at a sagittal image, images like this, and you can see the same arachnoid cyst posterior to the cerebellum. It's also common to see them in the middle temporal fossa. Here you can see a right middle temporal fossa arachnoid cyst behind the right eye, a very common location. Sometimes you get enlargement of the normal fluid-filled space behind the cerebellum, the cisterna magna, and when it's very enlarged, it's sometimes called a mega cisterna magna. Sometimes arachnoid cyst can be massive. Here you can see a very large left middle temporal fossa arachnoid cyst obscuring the entire left temporal lobe. I have a patient with a very similar MRI finding who is completely asymptomatic. It was an incidental finding. Here's a different type of cyst, Rathke's cleft cyst arising from the embryonic structure Rathke's pouch. Sometimes these cysts can grow and compress surrounding structures and cause symptoms, but they're often benign incidental findings located at the mid line. This is a sagittal image near the area of the pituitary gland. Here is the pons, the spinal cord, and the tongue for orientation. This slide doesn't show an incidental finding. This is Arnold Chiari malformation. You're looking at sagittal images. This is the spinal cord, and here's the cerebellum herniating through the frame and magnum. This disrupts flow of cerebral spinal fluid, causing the central canal to enlarge and push on surrounding structures. This image would often be associated with symptoms like headaches in the back of the head, dizziness, pain and temperature sensation loss in the neck, arms, and torso. However, sometimes there's a sort of mild variant of this where the cerebellar tonsils lie low down through the foramen magnum, the hole where the spinal cord exits the cranial vault. And this is very minimal and often a harmless incidental finding, not causing any symptoms. In this this MRI above the cella turcica in the area where the pituitary gland normally is, there's an empty cella appearance where it appears to be filled with fluid. This is typically a benign incidental finding, although observational studies suggest that it is associated with the condition idiopathic intracranial hypertension, a condition mostly seen in young women who can have headaches and vision loss. And in some case, an empty cella appearance is expected, as in someone who has a prior pituitary surgery, so empty space in the area is expected. Let's move to calcium. On the left is actually a CAT scan, and on the right is a gradient echo sequence of the MRI scan. And both show that the falx cerebri, the normal fibrous structure between the two cerebral hemispheres, has some calcium. This is a common incidental finding. It is not a calcified meningioma. Sometimes the calcification can be quite impressive, as in this image. It's also common to have calcification in the area of the basal ganglia that's often very symmetrical, and in the pineal gland. On the right is actually a CAT scan. On the left is an MRI. You can also have cysts of the pineal gland. You're looking at sagittal images. Here is the midbrain, and immediately above that is the pineal gland cyst. If there's confusion about whether the lesion is a cyst or a tumor, it may be necessary to do an MRI scan with contrast 
contrast, though pineal cysts are quite common and known to be benign. Next, we look at some variation of the midline structure, the septum pellucidum. Normally, the lateral ventricles, these fluid-filled spaces, are divided by a single fibrous septum pellucidum near the midline, but sometimes it's separated into two, known as a bifid septum pellucidum. Sometimes only the posterior aspect is divided, known as cavum velum interpositum. We move to a vascular abnormality. Now, a lot of vascular abnormalities that can be incidental findings have a risk of bleeding, such as arteriovenous malformation or aneurysm, but these developmental venous anomalies are thought to be extremely low risk. On the upper image, you can see one in the left frontal lobe, and on the lower image, one in the right cerebellum. They can be recognized because there are many small strands converging, kind of a head of Medusa appearance. These are common findings. I remember one of my very first nights on call when I became an attending physician in 2015, an ER doctor said, I have this patient, I think she has migraine, but the radiologist is reading that there could be a dural venous thrombosis. And they had an MRI scan that looked something like this. And here you can see the dural venous sinuses, and there are these dark things, including a prominent one on the left. But this is not a clot or a thrombosis. This is a known benign variant called an arachnoid granulation, and this is the tissue that allows the resorption of the cerebral spinal fluid back into the venous system completely harmless. Sometimes we see cerebrospinal fluid structures deep within the brain tissue that could mimic a small old stroke, but these are actually benign perivascular spaces or collections of normal cerebrospinal fluid around the blood vessels, also known as Verkau Robin spaces. Sometimes they can be quite enlarged and prominent. Moving back to calcifications, another area that's common to get heavy benign calcification is in the core plexus. This is actually a CT scan. I couldn't find a good example on MRI. But these heavily calcified areas are actually the normal choroid plexus, the tissue that creates the cerebral spinal fluid. You can also get them in the fourth ventricle. These are axial images down low. This is the pons and the cerebellum. And here you can see a CAT scan and the right two images are MRI scans showing calcifications of the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, which is this fluid would fill space. This midline structure surrounding the corpus callosum is very T1 bright, just like the subcutaneous fat, because it is fat. This is a benign lipoma. This is a very common location at the midline. You can also get them posterior to the midbrain in the area of the quadrigeminal cistern. This is an axial image from a T2 flare MRI showing these small T2 bright subcortical white matter lesions. They they could be mistaken for something like multiple sclerosis, but these tiny indistinct lesions are actually known as unidentified bright objects or UBOs. They're known to be associated with migraine headaches and vascular risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and aging. It's hard to call them completely benign because they are associated with vascular risk factors, and autopsy studies suggest they are due to vascular disease, but they don't indicate a specific medical condition. It's also common on MRI scans to see some T2 brightness in the area of the optic radiations and around the periventricular caps, especially in the frontal area. Lastly, we sometimes see things outside of the brain. Here is a sebaceous or sweat gland cyst that's actually outside of the skull, though it could be surgically removed if it's causing symptoms. On this MRI, we can see a prominent deviated septum, a fairly common incidental finding, even if the person isn't complaining of any breathing difficulties. Deviated septums are just quite common and don't necessarily change the external appearance of the nose. And of course, there are many other incidental findings on MRI brain I didn't mention here. I'd be interested to know, did you have an MRI of your brain? Why did you have the scan? And did you have any of these findings? And what was your response to finding out you had this result? And please share any other incidental findings I didn't mention here, or if you have suggestions for other videos.